Good morning. Welcome to the first event of 2018 for the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia. A happy and healthy New Year 2018 to all of you, and a satisfying and successful year of the dog within a month that begins a month from now. We, let me start by giving a background on the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia. We, as you know, when you come to Sunway, your first impression is there's this beautiful tall building, and you know that we have a very good education. Uh, we are, have a very, we provide, Sunway provides an excellent education from high school through university. But in this age of rapid technological changes and institutional innovations, innovations and global uh, transformations, there is a need for lifelong learning. And the Institute of Southeast Asia, the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia, is Jeffrey Chia's contribution to improve the, the life learn, lifelong learning uh, process in Malaysia. The role of the Institute is to come up with the best practical solutions for Malaysian and Southeast Asian problems. We, the hope is to work with the government and to mobilize society to, to undertake the task of implementing the best solution, practical solutions to Malaysia's problems. Today, we are very happy to partner with the Economic Planning Unit to discuss about the latest project, Transformation, Transformasi National 2050. Transformasi 2050 is, of course, not the first path-breaking program of the Najib government since it assumed uh, administration in 2014. But that was, after all, the first big major change was the new economic model, a plan that intends to drastically jettison the, econ the new economic policy with, with reversals like greatly reducing the system of quantitative restrictions in various activities and to greatly boost government performance through, pro through agencies like Pemandu. Change was certainly in the air. I remember a prominent member in, uh, international advisor to the new economic model who said that we must have the GST. If we don't have the GST, we'll end up being like Greece, where we'll come under, where there'll be cuts in government con uh, spending across the board, causing great social misery. Well, the new economic model is still in existence but the fruits have yet to really appear. And when something, and what, when something does not seem to really deliver yet, the usual response is what the doctors say. When you call up and say, I got a headache and a pain in my chest, they'll say, take two aspirins and call me in, in the morning tomorrow. The next day comes, you say, I still, have that headache, and the pain is even greater. Two choices. One choice is take six aspirins and call me in a few hours. Or the other one is, let's try something new. And the Transformacy National 2050 is a very bold, ambitious, comprehensive revamping of of policies, and the hopeful outcomes would make Malaysia be one of the top 20 countries in the world. So 
The organization of today's discussion will go as follows. First, we'll have Johan Marikan, who's leading the work on Transformacy 2050, to tell us about this latest exciting program. Then we'll have Tan Siri Lin to discuss the program, putting it in historical perspective and his assessment of the way forward. And then I'll add a few prosaic comments and we'll open it for open discussion. So let me invite Johan Merican to come on stage to deliver his presentation. CN. Thank you, and a very good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, first and foremost, um, Professor Wu, thank you so much for that very um, kind uh, introduction. Uh, and a very big thank you and also apologies, because it's been very difficult, uh, I think, uh, They've been they've, they've they've bent over backwards, I think, to accommodate me uh, for for today's presentation. I've had to reschedule a couple of times, and I'm very grateful that that you you we've managed to organize uh, today, and you know very impressed by the the crowd that we've assembled, and I see some very familiar faces. Because as it is, I was already quite stressed when I was told that um, Tan Sri Lin Sien was going to be the panelist to comment on my presentation, because you know he's indeed one of the sharpest minds in in, in, in the country, and it's already going to be quite stressful uh, having to hear for his comments, but also in the crowd, I see also some very eminent and very experienced public servants on top of um, uh, you know, people from, whether it's from World Bank or even at many, many organizations uh, in government and also private sector. So I, uh, I, I look forward, I look forward to, your, to your engagement. And I think um, maybe before I go into my, my, my slides, I think the main um, message perhaps we want to share is that today, I think historically, uh, Malaysia has been very successful. But certainly, we have major challenges. And as we look ahead, uh, both challenges as a result of global developments and also our own internal uh, structural issues. And if we are then going to continue to succeed uh, as a nation and, and rise to even greater success, um, it certainly needs a whole of nation approach. Uh, Work, government working together with pub, private sector, academia, the, the, the broader civil society, if we are then to really continue to be successful um, as, as, an, as a nation. But with that, let me just go through my, my, my slides. Um, let me just first start off, give, just, just give you an overview in terms of how we look in terms of a framework that we, we wish to proceed in terms of developing a TN50 strategy. Um, as I mentioned, Malaysia today, we see Malaysia today as a successful upper middle income nation. And the ambition that the Prime Minister has set forth is to emerge a top 20 nation by 2050, a global leader, uh, if you if you like. What the Prime Minister then has, has, has committed to is what we call a bottom-up engagement. I think this, this whole notion that government doesn't know best, and this is a whole nation effort, we really want to engage the people in terms of understanding what their aspirations are for, for the future. Um, and at the same time, this needs to be combined together with what we call a top-down um, guidance, you know, really taking into account some of the global developments and an assessment of, of, of some of the issues that we have today, and trying to bring that together towards developing a strategy that, that really tries to you know, build on the trends of, of the world, um, integrate strategies across the various sectors uh, that we have, and, and try to build on, on our existing strengths uh, towards, towards the future. Let me just then motivate this point of, of first Malaysia being a successful uh, nation. Um, you know, we started, and I, I, and I you know, uh, I think Tan Tashi Lin Sien was reminding me because as, as we in EPU are, are, are now looking at a midterm review of the Malaysia plan, Tan Sri Lin Sien was there at the first Malaysia plan. Uh, and certainly at, at, you know, at independence, we were characterized as being a low income nation. We had a majority of Rakyat in, in, in poverty, and we had an economy just relying on two commodities, tin and rubber. And certainly today has been a massive transformation. We're now upper middle income nation. Um, absolute poverty has certainly been addressed. Um, and we're relatively diversified industrial economy. And, and it's not just from our assessment. I think we've had various people comments to that effect. Um, one certainly was the growth report, which back uh, 2008, you know, at least acknowledged Malaysia as being one of only 13 countries in the entire world that had consistently high growth over a prolonged period in, during the post-1950 uh, period. And, and recognizing that the, whilst these countries were very different uh, in terms of their, of their features, 
certain common characteristics were, were there in terms of you know, openness to the global economy. You know, we're now very proud of Malaysia being one of these where you know, imports plus exports more than 100% GDP. Um, macro you know, stability, you know, whether both from a monetary and fiscal policy, I think we've ensured, and stayed, ensured that, that stability. We've always had a future orientation, and I'll touch more on that. Uh, and, and I guess TN50 continues in that tradition. We've always really been one not bound by, by dogma, but supported a, a market-based economy and having a leadership that's committed to growth and inclusiveness. So that's part of, I guess, maybe a context in terms of, of, of the success of Malaysia uh, thus, thus far. And TN50 continues in this tradition, and we speak about this future orientation, uh, continues in this tradition of wanting to have an orientation of looking ahead to the future. Um, I guess coming from EPU, we've always been an, a, a country and a government that's always done long-term development uh, planning, um, starting from the new economic policy from, um, so that was from the second Malaysia plan. Uh, uh, up to fifth Malaysia plan, uh, we then had Vision 2020 taking us from 1991 to 2020. And, and with 2020 just round the corner, uh, Prime Minister has now then initiated this process, what next post-2020 in terms of articulating a need for a vision and it's been called um, Transformation National uh, 2050, National Transformation 2050. And at least he set out uh, at least an ambition of reaching out to be a top 20 nation. But really, one difference perhaps from the past, and I think it's part of, of, of the theme that the Prime Minister has said, that no, no longer are we in an era that government knows best. Uh, it needs to be a bottom-up approach in terms of formulating and, and, and developing the, the national transformation so that ultimately this vision um, it's not just top-down, it then is one that is by the people, uh, with the people, and ultimately uh, for, for the people. But let us look back um, towards history, and I, I mentioned that this is a continuity from both um, the new economic policy and also the Vision 2020. And let's perhaps look at perhaps some of the achievements and remaining challenges. And I guess this is one of those classic scenarios where the economists will say that, you know, on one hand and then on the other hand. So there are certainly areas where the glass is half full, but maybe perhaps also some areas, notable areas, where the glass is half empty. I think as many of you are aware, the new economic policy was one that was anchored towards um, national unity, uh, given the context of May 1969. Um, we've really a, a principal goals in terms of eradicating poverty irrespective of race and restructuring um, society in terms of eliminating the identification of race with economic function. I think on many fronts there have been great success. Um, absolute poverty um, has been addressed from a time where we had almost half the population uh, in, po in poverty. It's now been reduced down to 0.4% based on the latest uh, statistics. Um, income inequality has been addressed, and, and we see that in terms of the reduced uh, Gini coefficient, because sometimes we may achieve greater wealth, but it doesn't necessarily come together to reduce um, uh, inequality. And we see at least for income inequality, it's gone down from 0.5 down to 0.4. And one which at least EPU always was tracked, looking in terms of also inter interracial differences, that also has been, has been reduced as we look based on, on income ratios and also in terms of the growth of equity. But whilst that is the glass half full, certainly there are some challenges uh, in terms of looking at the glass, uh, early, at least really on, on, on the other hand. And whilst absolute poverty has certainly be, been addressed and, and almost virtually eliminated, and we talk about uh, poverty rate 0.4%, certainly the issue of relative poverty, I think, increasingly comes to fore. Um, you know, and I think that's also, you see in that in terms of the sentiment, particularly in terms of you know, how cost of living is particularly affecting uh, um, a large portion of, of our, our, our community. And that's why when we looked into the 11 Malaysia plan, our shift has gone towards looking at the bottom 40% 40 of households. And there we see that their share of, of income has perhaps not progressed as much as we would like. Um, you know, over the period from 1970, even right now to the most recent, we see that bottom 40% of households only has 16% of, of income. But perhaps the, the inequality is even greater when we look from an asset perspective rather than income. So whilst a lot of uh, success we achieve from an, or an income inequality aspect, the, the asset inequality perhaps is a space where, where we do see. Uh, so whilst the income Gini coefficient is, you know, I would say you know, successful, at, it's at 0.399. Um, you know, I, I give, for example, a couple where, for example, the, the Gini coefficient of EPF savings uh, at 0 0.658, and just maybe just to motivate that point, the top 20,000 uh, EPF holders, which is only about 20,000 of them, 0.2% uh, of, of active holders, have more EPF savings than the bottom 
47% of uh, uh, EPF account holders. You know, that's quite a stark point. And even more so when you look at the Gini coefficient of ASB again. And that perhaps when you look at ASB, because we give them that, I'm not that I guess points towards the point about um, intra-racial inequality perhaps being even now uh, greater than inter. Uh, and maybe that's an increasing challenge that we need to look at um, um, going, going forward. Another issue is also in terms of uh, the slice of the pie for the economy, and, and one of the measures that we look at is uh, the compensation of employment as a percentage of GDP in terms of what is the proportion that's going to the, to, to the workers effectively in terms of, of wages and salaries. And, and that we see, whilst, whilst we've achieved some, some progress, um, back in 2000, it was still about 28%, it's grown to 35%, um, but we're still well below um, what we call um, peers, um, you know, Singapore's at 43%, Korea's 45%. Even uh, Thailand is, is, is above 40%. And, and that sometimes perhaps links back to perhaps the structure of economy where for a long time we've always emphasized perhaps economic model where um, the returns are more towards the owners of risk capital, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and then the less to, to, to the workers given that at that point probably a low skill base. Um, but that certainly needs to be a model or distribution. It needs to change if we want to proceed towards a more innovation-led or knowledge-intensive um, um, economic base. I now shift to Vision 2020. Um, I think this was something that was very inspiring at the time. I remember being a school child in 1990 and, and being very excited about Notion wanting to be a developed nation. Um, we certainly see, in, in some aspects, Malaysia has been very successful you know, in terms of you know, global competitiveness. I think if we look at various... Uh, uh, global indices, you know, whether on com competitiveness of, of, of doing business, we certainly seem to be batting above our weight. Um, you know, most of the countries ranked above us are almost exclusively high-income nations, uh, you know, in, in some of these rankings. And in terms of where we are in terms of our, our income, we made some very good progress towards reaching the, the high-income threshold. Back in 2014, we were even within 16.5% um, of, of the high-income threshold. Um, although that perhaps has weakened now to widen a bit more down to about 20% given the weakening of, of, of ringgit, but certainly we made a lot of progress in terms of income. But certainly wanting to aspire to be a successful uh, high-income nation wasn't just about trying to achieve an abstract economic statistic. It's ultimately about how do we promote um, the well-being of the rakyat. And I think in this respect, we do acknowledge that social well-being has lagged um, economic well-being uh, when we look at some of these indices. And certainly when, you know, whilst I think when everyone is typically asked about what they think of Vision 2020, people always can remember it's a developed nation in our own mold. Um, not, not many people would remember the nine challenges that was artic originally articulated in the Way Forward speech. But certainly some of those challenges that were articulated then in 1990 continue to be a major challenge. You know, whether, you know, the first challenge which talks about trying to establish a Bangsa Malaysia or United uh, Malaysian Nation, um, Establishing a society that, that's moral, uh, you know, tolerant and just, and also this ambition about wanting to be a, um, at least a sixth challenge in terms of not just being a consumer of, of, of technology, but also a, a producer. And yet our economic structure is still one that's dependent very much on, on imported um, uh, uh, technology, and we're not necessarily producing, and, and that's, you know, I see Tanji Tukosunga, effectively now, our electronics industry, uh, perhaps, you know, we started around the same time as, as, as Taiwan, we've been very good at, like, them bringing in the, the FDIs, but perhaps not as good as developing our own homegrown uh, 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 electronics giants or sources of, of IP in that, in that space. So that's a very, you know, um, um, high-level snapshot in terms of some of our successes, but also some of the remaining challenges against what we had aspired in past uh, visions. I now want to switch over to what I mentioned earlier about the process that TN50 has been undertaking in terms of this bottom-up engagement. And as I mentioned, the Prime Minister has, has acknowledged that the era of government knowing best is, is over, and therefore we need to then involve uh, Malaysians of, across all segments towards the formulation of of TN50, and, and thus far, obviously a lot of engagement has been done with the youth, especially being those who will inherit Malaysia come 2050, and more than 2 million have been reached through platforms including social media, collected more than 100,000 aspirations in terms of what they hope, and it's been done through a combination of whether it's physical engagements, um, workshops, um, and involving the highest level of leadership in government. 
whilst there are as, as, you know, thousands of, of aspirations, at least allow me to give you some high-level themes that seem to come out from, from these aspirations. I think first and foremost, it's almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, we see that Malaysians at, at least an individual level and for their families, you know, obviously seek to aspire to have basically a comfortable lifestyle, being able to afford the lifestyle they want, being able to access, you know, um, affordable housing, uh, good health care and quality education, having, you know, good jobs, um, a crime-free environment for, their, for themselves and their family. That's really it in terms of their aspirations at individual or family level. Then next up, at a society level, Malaysians look forward to more sustainable and inclusive society. Uh, and I think that ties very much. I think we are very particularly inspired with what has been done uh, by the Jeffries uh, Institute and also now particularly in terms of the Jeff Sex um, Center for Sustainable Development. I think this is a very important thing as we, as we look ahead. Um, how can we improve the sustainability of our, of our economic uh, development model? Um, and certainly we need to work together with such um, uh, brain power uh, towards really formulating how do we advance that part. And I think there's also an aspect about also ensuring how do we then ensure inclusiveness of opportunities. Um, uh, whilst we cannot get an equality of outcome, certainly we should then aspire, to aspire for equality of opportunity and whether in terms of whether on, on their background, and get this harks back to I think some of the ambitions of, of the new economic policy, um, whether it, you know, rural versus urban in terms of rebalancing development. And then last but not least at the country level, uh, I think also there's always this, this strong sense that Malaysians take pride of Malaysia achieving um, success at the global level. I know sometimes that is achieved at sports, but I think it's increasing as we look forward to 2050, we want to then see Malaysia succeed as, 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 an, as standing, standing tall amongst among the nations in the world. But at the same time, what comes out also very strongly in many of our aspirations is Malaysians want that, that, that success, but not at the expense of our values. Um, and, and that comes back in terms of being able to still safeguard uh, our values, our identity um, as a nation. Um, Many obviously, obviously, still very much want to see Malaysia as a united nation in, in celebration of, of our of diversity that we've always had uh, since since the beginning. So those are the aspirations. And the key is that how do we then translate that to to a TN50 or a strategy for the country going forward? I want to share with you. <coughs> sorry, I want to share with you a bit more a bit more details. Um, the Ministry of Youth and, and Sports has has um, in in doing their their youth engagement. It's about to launch a report by the end of this month. I want to just share um, perhaps some, some snapshots or perhaps some of the ambitions uh, or some targets that, that, that Malaysians also want to aspire across uh, different aspects, you know, whether in terms of the economy. Um, you know, obviously, education comes out also quite strongly, particularly from the youth. And society, I think, and the recognition that, you know, especially in a more regional nation, we want to also have a more, um, you know, leverage on our diversity as a, as a multicultural um, country to also be be able to access the opportunities that offers in this region. Um, you know, governance, I think this comes up very strongly. How do we increase the strength of governance in terms of, of effectiveness, the corruption perception? Culture also comes up as, as that in terms of retaining that, that value and identity, as I mentioned earlier. And sustainability comes up very strongly, not just in terms purely from an environment, like from a carbon sort of perspective, but also in terms of security, in terms of food source, energy source, um, the like. And ultimately, in terms of also, as I said, it's not just about an economic statistic, we ultimately Malaysians want to have a well-being and quality of life. But these are what we get from aspirations from the people. And we cannot obviously look at these um, and it be, be sort of in exclusion of what's happening around the world and how it will, how it will affect uh, a country like Malaysia. I'd like to switch then in terms of what are some of the megatrends that we see and how we then need to obviously then take these into account as we shape um, uh, 1050 going forward. And these are some major challenges. And, and sometimes, before I go into details, what we see is that you know, some even perhaps contest whether there really is a fourth industrial revolution. Um, but whether, it, whether there is such a thing or not, what seems undeniable is that there is certainly a speed and scale of change uh, reverberating around through the world. And that and Malaysia, particularly as an open economy, you know, certainly will not, cannot escape, escape it. And, and what's What's perhaps of, of worry is that what we then perhaps seem to observe is I think in Malaysia generally uh, there does seem to be either a lack of of a lack of awareness, but certainly a, a sense of, of inaction uh, to really appreciating the speed and scale of some of these changes. Um, 
which then really bodes well that the challenge going forward for TN50 is not only just to look at addressing our current issues, but how can we also change very quickly to be responsive to some of these global changes? Um, some obviously things like urbanization, um, as I think we all know, you know, there's been rapid urbanization. Even back in 1970, when you had urbanization rate of about 26%, uh, today it's already crossed 75%. And who knows, we're, we're going to hit 90% um, uh, come 2050. I think even the, maybe the whole notion of Balik Kampung may be a thing of the past. Uh, maybe all of us will be here. And certainly, you know, we know that at least even in, in government, the structure of government perhaps is not fully shifted in terms of its appropriate weightage from, from rural to, to you know, urban development. But certainly, early steps have been taken, such as, you know, heavy investments that have been put into public transportation to ensure, in terms of you know, very familiar with that, in terms of how to ensure support that we have the, the, global, um, you know, the global competitiveness of, of uh, uh, cities with its agglomeration, but without being choked up uh, in terms of inefficiencies if it gets you know, uh, inefficient. Certainly, we also have um, an aging society. I think Malaysia, for a very long time, we've always seen ourselves as a young nation. We still have an average age of about 26, but but very quickly, and very quickly compared to many other nations, we're quickly becoming an, an aging nation. Um, part of it, I guess, is uh, better healthcare. We've had uh, longer longevity. Um, but beyond that, um, also, obviously, fairly sharp drop in, in fertility. Um, amazingly, back in 1960, I think the average fertility of about six uh, children for an average um, lady. Um, today, it's dropped down below... Um, Replacement rate is about 1.93. Um, 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 obviously, it would help if it's higher, but let it not come from me. That's government policy for Malaysians have more sex. But the point is, we certainly we have um, that effect of of not having that growth in the labour markets that we enjoyed, particularly in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and certainly, going forward, we then need to then drive more of a productivity-led led growth model. Uh, because we cannot then rely on that. But beyond that, obviously, the aging nation then also has implications on, for example, the healthcare system, the social safety net, and perhaps, you know, in some way has a, a healthcare a business. I think that certainly is something that, that will definitely be increasingly relevant going, going, going forward. I mean, digitalization, I think I, I don't need to, I think I, all of this room particularly are, are very well aware about some of the implications of, of of um, technology such as, as AI, for example. Um, but while many people sometimes think that, oh, maybe the first jobs to go are, are the, we'll just robotize the, the cheap foreign labor type of, of roles, I think one of the things we've already seen is that while Malaysia has been very successful in courting shared services to Malaysia and particularly growth in shared service finance, we think those are the sort of jobs that are becoming automated even faster because the returns on investment for automating such jobs are, are greater. And, and that's perhaps one of the things where we, you know, we used to tell people to be accountants because in the good times you need accountants, bad times you need accountants. But you know, these are the sort of jobs that we've always pushed for, you know, that growth of, middle in, uh, our, of our middle classes to, to pursue. Those perhaps are some of the jobs under threat. And that so requires a very new, new approach in, in, in terms of what really then should be the jobs of future that we need to prepare our workforce for. Um, just share maybe some other... Um, some of these other developments, whether in terms of resource, resource scarcity, um, certainly that's why the government had then had to embark, embark on perhaps quite un, unpopular steps like you know, subsidy rationalization, really perhaps looking ahead to, to the headwinds. I think geopolitical shift, I think most of the, the trends always tend to be more challenges. Certainly for the geopolitical shift is one area where we see um, it favoring uh, Malaysia. Uh, we see the center of economic growth shifting towards Asia, and I think Malaysia naturally having, you know, um, our geopolitical position, um, you know, historical, cultural, and, and also a trade ties with some major nations certainly helps in terms of what we see as, as, as the future going ahead. But how do we then reinforce our nation really as to reap the full benefits uh, in terms of regional integration? Um, and I think to some extent, we've already taken some steps. I think, I think Malaysia should be very proud. I think, you know, although of, obviously Trump coming in has put paid to the TPPA, but in the same year that we were, Malaysia was negotiating TPPA, we were you know, having conversations with China one belt on the road. Um, I think this year we've had both visits from, from the Saudi king and the Qatar Emir. I think Malaysia continues to really try to really build its linkages so that it continues to be integrated with you know, major uh, economic centers of, of, of the world of growth. Uh, in terms of societal change, I think this is one area that I think 
you know, Malaysia still aspires to be a global voice of moderation, certainly because of some of the headwinds, particularly in terms of, of extremism. But key is how do we convert our natural diversity from a potential source of tension to a potential source of, of strength uh, for the nation going forward. But these are all, as I, as I mentioned, more questions rather than answers. And I think we recognize this as we look ahead, um, as we look ahead, and I just want to conclude on, on this slide, as we look ahead for, on, on you know, some of our past success, um, you know, and it's been anchored on, on you know, long-term development planning and, and and there's some, in terms of, you know, that continuation tradition certainly bodes, bodes well. There are many challenges uh, that, that, that we face, uh, both in terms of addressing our current uh, issues and also in terms of some of these global developments. And certainly that's something that we can't do, uh, can't do alone. I mean, the government can play its role in terms of bringing together the aspiration of Rakyat and, and in terms of bringing together how best to respond to some of these global developments, building on some of comparative advantages, but certainly needs a whole of country uh, approach. Um, and the common belief and common strategy in terms of how do we then work together towards common goals if Malaysia is going to continue to succeed in what promises to be an increasingly uncertain and, and challenging future for not just Malaysia, but also other nations um, in, in the world. And I guess always coming back, and, and you know, even in our historical um, tradition of, of new economic policy, I think at the, at the end of at, the, at its core is something that we want to see continually a continuity of Malaysia's united nation, a harmonious nation. But certainly, success would want us to then continue in terms of building prosperity to build a better quality life for all, all Malaysians. But at the same time, doing so in in, in a sustainable basis, um, and that. Certainly, there are certain trade-offs, and we all know some of these. How do we then find that right balance so that we can be more prosperous, but at the same time safeguard um, Malaysia for, to be on a sustainable business model? Um, I, want, I, I, I want to end on a, maybe just to share um, a video. Maybe just uh, I know it's been quite painful listening to just a, a monologue from me. Uh, maybe also just to give me also a, a, a sort of a intermission break. I think one of the challenges that, you know, especially when I speak to some of my elders, uh, in whom I highly respect, and, and sometimes they hark back in terms of some challenges, particularly way back when we talked about new economic policy in terms of, of, of the, the unity that's required to forge the nation forward. I was quite inspired. Um, I, I, how many of you watched uh, the movie Hidden Figures? Okay, not many. I, I want to just share a very short clip from, from it um, in terms of maybe just to motivate uh, this, this point um, hang on, I'll maybe speak about it a bit later after, um, hang on, yeah, maybe just share with you this clip. Button it up, Mary. Nobody was going to jail behind your mouth for doing all this shit. You be a disrespectful? No, sir. You have identification on it? Yes. Yes, sir. We're just on our way to work. That mainly? NASA, sir. We do a great deal of the calculating. Getting our rockets into space. All three? Yes, sir. Yes, officer. NASA? That's so. I had no idea they hired. There are quite a few women working in the space program. <laughs> Damn Russians are watching us right now. Sputniks. You girls ever meet those astronauts? Mercury said. Absolutely. Uh, yes, sir. We work with those gentlemen all the time. Those boys are the best we got. I'm sure it has. Yeah. <laughs> We gotta get a man up here before the commies do. Old damn country scout more. That's for certain. Hard being a service broken down on the side of the road. Right, right. Uh, what, y'all need a tow or something? No, thank you, officer. I, I think I gotta just get in there. Just need to back half the starter. She's good at this stuff. 
I just wanted to close on that because I think even at the time, I, I guess it, I draw some form of inspiration. I mean, looking back at the U.S., the 1960s, obviously a time of of, of deep um, oh, well, segregation was was the norm back in the 60s, and obviously even um, participation of women and blacks in the economy was obviously quite limited. Um, but certainly at that time, Kennedy articulated a moonshot uh, to put a man on the moon. And it was interesting that I guess this was just a, a you know way of motivating the point of how the the, the policeman obviously then at least has his own biases or, 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 or views. But put in the context of what then, then was the national mission, went from someone who basically was, was obviously treating the three ladies badly to one then offering to, to give them an escort all the way to work. And perhaps that is a key question that perhaps uh, is posed to our nation, whatever our differences are, or, or, or views, is there then a common moonshot or, or common mission that can galvanize our country together so that we can then be successful towards, uh, the f towards a more glorious and better nation for the future? And with that, thank you very much. In a way, I epitomize the country I come from. <laughs> Tithering, but succeeding in the end, nevertheless. So let me invite Tan Sri Lin Sien to come up to discuss the common purpose vision picture that we have just seen. I saw a put how many people something together. I read uh, Noah's slides last time. And I said uh, to myself, I'm no longer recovered. I better get back, put everybody's feet back to the ground. So, what I'm going to do today is provide you with the background where I said what the said what I'll talk a little bit about what's happening now as I see it. What's going to happen in the next 18 months? Because 2050 is so far from <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm 79 years old this year. I don't think I'll come very really close to 2050 to see what the one has done. So I thought. Uh, and I've been out of government for, what, 20 years now? I think 18 months is as far as I can see. So I will present to you my take on what's happening here, despite what the World Bank and IMF say, and uh, try to do something with the what the Johan said just now from the ground up. So, if I may just start off, when I was at Harvard in the 60s, my first exposure was to Nobel laureate Professor Kutztan. I learned by GNP and things like that from him. And uh, what he told me came back last night, namely, the GNP is not well-being. I think we have to bear that in mind. That well-being may not be sustainable. What's important is we need to relate GNP to wealth. And that's critical. Because uh, I just came back from Poland, and this friend of mine told me, you know, you economists, you confuse flows with stocks. I think something which 
accountants are very familiar. And that's a bad confusion. You can't size up an economy by looking at its GNP. <coughs> GNP talks largely of past activity, whereas wealth talks, makes you look forward. In fact, I like to look at wealth, a GNP, GDP as the return on wealth. I just wanted to put this in your ba uh, as a background because I'm going to come back to that uh, when I talk about the future afterwards. My take on what's happening now. I think the real economy, as I said, despite what the World Bank and IMF have said, the real economy here has lost its edge. They talk of very high growth for this year. I think we are on a sugar high. I think those, those who have kids know what I'm talking about. It must growing signs of, to use a polite word, fatigue. I think there's a disconnect between government statistics and what's happening on the ground. You know, I'm a hawker person. Every weekend, I'm at hawker stalls on Saturday, Sunday, and even during weekdays. And there's a huge connect, disconnect. Hawkers, some of my, my Kuitiao men were saying that, you know, World Bank says we grow five and a half percent. Ask him to come and see me. <laughs> yeah. They don't eat that. <laughs> so what's the effect of the real Yeah, I mean, seriously. Yeah. There's a disconnect. I'm chairman of the largest mall in town. I think maybe Jeffrey Chia would dispute that with me. I'm chairman of, of Mid Valley. We are rated to be the most successful retail space in town, we are having problems. We don't see that five and a half percent. You know? Uh, although we have 250 shops waiting to, for space, the real problem is getting people to buy. Part of the reason is, and this, you don't have to believe me, we have surveys by the retail associations. There are two associations. I just talked to them. And they are just trying to be polite. Basically, they are telling me things are down. Retail sales are down. And we have a problem. The real problem there is loss of purchasing power. The ringgit doesn't go as far as it used to go. Johan talks of trade, imports 100% of GNP, exports 100% of GNP. Everything we have is imported. I used to pay $4, $5 for my kuitiao. Today I pay $7. Yeah. And one of them, my Sarawak Laksa, moved to better premises. He charged me 10 bucks. <laughs> you know? And I say, why? He say again, look, the prawns are imported, the noodles, everything imported. You know? We are paying the price of a weak currency. I'll come back to currency afterwards. Because this is something that has been ignored. And this is very important because we are told by the officials at the World Bank that the trust of the growth is consumption. But with weak purchasing power, you're going to have a problem in your hands. So let me turn it around. If, as most people tell us, that the economy is fundamentally strong. Why is the currency so weak? Why is there no rush 
of inflows of FDIs. More importantly, why is youth unemployment so high? I'll come back to this afterwards. But that's my take for now. That I don't feel that 5.5% growth that everybody is talking about. I turn next to the next 18 months. Not very good at technology. Again, I come back to Johan's point. We are a big trader. You know, look, very few countries that are not entrepreneurial have exports and imports 200% of GNP. So what happens in the world matters for us. So I ask myself the question, what can go wrong in this year? When the world is humming well, everything is, is uh, fine and dandy, there's lots of growth, despite the bad politics, what can go wrong? On reflection, I think what didn't happen last year might come back to haunt us this year. I named eight of them here. I think it's eight or seven. I'm sure you can add a few more, right? Like war, inflation. But seven, these seven are interesting. I just run through them very quickly. I think they are all, all visual. Markets have gone crazy. They have gone above politics. Despite all the bad politics, all the markets are up. Right? You can see from there, that's the S&P 500. That's up 20%. The world FTSE is up 22%. Emerging markets is up 35%. So everything is above politics. That can come back to haunt us this year. We have been talking of more than three tightening for a while. Didn't happen last year, as you can see from the graph. Things are easy. The world central banks today have 4.3 trillion US dollars in government paper. This is the, just the Fed alone. 4.3 trillion. They're going to have this big unwind. When they unwind, things will tighten. Haven't started yet, as you can see from the graph, but it will tighten in 18, 19. So this again can come and haunt us this year, the tightening of money. You might get a Trump bump. You know, this is the United States, and this graph shows the output gap. That means the gap between potential rate of growth, potential GNP and real GNP have closed. There's no more gap. I think there's a lot of, uh, I think, and I'm one of them who believe that growth in the United States is reaching its peak. But, you know, if you look after the war, there's been very few disruptions. We have the oil shock. They're all shown up there. The Gulf War, the Asian crisis. The but they are relatively small bumps. But bumps can happen. This is a complicated graph, but it's important. If you look at the top end of it, if you look back 60 years, look back 60 years, there have been three occasions where the rate of unemployment in the United States is below 4.5%. Last year was the fourth time. What happened every time that the US unemployment fell below 4.5%? Potential rate of growth is exceeded by real growth. And then you have recession. It happened three times. Every time the unemployment fell below four, four and a half, there's recession. I mentioned earlier just now, the gap is closed. 
will we have recession soon? Because unemployment is 4.1. China rising. I remember last year, everybody had been talking about China being, having become so big, is going to slow down and going to affect everybody's growth. It didn't happen. This graph shows that for the first time, growth in money in China has fallen below nominal growth. The last time this happened, there was a world recession. Now, this is an interesting graph for those who are investors. Until the end of the 90s, the relation between bonds and share prices was positive. They all move in the same direction. Since then, they vary inversely. It happened last year. The real question is, with bond yields rising, would share prices fall this year? That's interesting. Fear of a strong dollar. It didn't happen last year. Last year, the, the US dollar became very weak. It declined by 14% against the euro. It's today 120 per euro. People are expecting the US dollar to rise with the Fed raising interest rates, with the tax expansion, with the tax break. So that can upset a lot of things, including the ringgit. So these are some of the things that didn't happen in last year and can come back to haunt us this year. But the good news is the latest survey of economists in the United States, if you believe the economists, they say that the chance of recession is for only 14%. So you can ignore what I've just told you. <laughs> then after taking that aside, I want to touch on something which, whether he likes it or not, he has to face, Johan. If he, ha if he is to take us to the year 2050, reforms. I think everybody avoids that word, including the World Bank. And um, I did a little bit of deep dive. I think we, there's no way we can get out of where we are today without reforms. Serious reforms I'm talking about. I'm going to indicate some of them to you. I'll start off with growth. This dependence on consumption for growth. Those of you who follow the literature, uh, and the best I can refer you to is those by the BIS, which came out some, with some reports to say that consumption can, is not a reliable source of growth for GNP. It's soft. It builds debt. It's systemically weak. As I say, it raises debt, curbs spending and drags on future demand. So if you look forward, it's not sustainable. What is important and sustainable is investment. And the investment, as you can see from the numbers, have slowed down. Of course, the 17 numbers have been recently revised upwards. But those of you businessmen here will know from the ground, the investments, real investments 
in the private sector is not happening. And that's serious. Second, if you look from the production side, output side, the, the, the trust to growth has been from construction. And you can see from the numbers, even construction has slowed down. Manufacturing has slowed down. But what is important in manufacturing is that manufacturing per se, in the manufacturing sector, that has slowed down simply because of this shift in electronics production from PCs and electronic, they need man, uh, electronic parts manufacturing to new, the, to the new manufacturing, 4.0 they call it, right? We talk of smart devices, wireless technology, IOTs, Internet of Things, the cloud. We are not producing those. We are not capable of doing those because ours are low skill manufacturing of parts. And so there's a big hole there. Third, the role of SOEs is eating more and more into the economy at the expense of the private of private initiative. And hence, there's less and less competition. If you look at the bursa, the, the list of listed companies, seven of the top ten are SOEs. And many of the second ten are SOEs. I think we're going to change that. And all these I've said so far helps to explain why productivity is so low. And that's another thing I learned from Kutznets. He told me that growth can come only from two sources, demography and productivity. Johan told us that we, can't, we, we, have, we have used up our demographic dividend. We can only, if we are to grow, we can only grow with productivity. And that's not coming. And that's worrisome. My next one is a favorite, unemployment. We all say, oh, I got unemployment in Malaysia. Well, we have four million imported labor. And now these are statistics from Bank Negara. Youth unemployment, 11%. 50% of the unemployed are youths, one half of the labor force. Graduates, 24% of them are unemployed. And that, after taking into account, government taking many of them into the government service as extras. Among the graduates, 50%. 55% of them earn less than 2,000 ringgit a month. That's uh, two, a year ago, 2016. That's serious. Bangladesh says it's because of labor market mismatch, limited job creation, and supply and lack of supply of industry-ready graduates. Now, this is a serious problem. I come next to my favorite subject, exchange rate. This has been prepared early in last year, or middle last, August last year. So I ended up with 16. In five years, five years up to the 16th, to, to, uh, in five years ending end of 2016, the ringgit depreciated by 36%. 36%. 
from 320 to 450. Last year, it pulled back and it's struggling to break the $4 mark. There's a huge depreciation. What for? We don't need a cheap exchange rate. People tell me that a cheap exchange rate helps our exports. Those guys have no clue what's happening in town. Our oil, our palm oil, in oil and palm oil, we are price takers. The exchange rate don't help us sell more. In manufacturing, we are value adders only. We import, put something inside, and export it out. The only thing that a cheap ringgit helps is subsidize Petronas and subsidize all the palm oil companies. All of them are doing very well. We don't need to subsidize them. The subsidies come from us because we are paying the cheap ringgit. That's my point. Of course, people like Top Glove benefits from it. But it's a bad way to promote our gloves by using the exchange. The wrong way, we should not use exchange rate to, to, to be competitive. We should use other means. Government can help that. I argue that we need to reclaim confidence in the ringgit. So long as people know that the ringgit keeps on sliding, you tell me what do they do with their wealth. When I joined Bank Negara in 1960, that was before Johan was born, <laughs> we were under the British, we had a currency board, we only had rubber and tin. The exchange rate was 306, three bucks. And we had nothing. In 60 years, we have become stronger. We have been everything what Johan said. We are 450. Doesn't make sense to me. If you look at those numbers, in the 60s, it was stable, 306. In the 70s and 80s, it was stable, varying between 290, 280, 290. In the 90s, 270, 280. When I retired, it was 250. Tell me what we have done to deserve this. I have to pay three bucks for a single dollar. It used to be on par. Why? The economy cannot be strong. If it's not strong, we need to reform. We need discipline. It can be done. If you ask me, and I've said so in my writings in the staff, Fair value for a ringgit is below 350. Closer to $3 than 350 for now. In fact, you can go better than that. De structural? I just want to indicate some of the type of reforms that, that we need before we can go to 2050. If you look at the latest, and, and uh, thank God we still have people doing some fundamental research on the basic economy. If you look at the calculations of potential GDP and G GDPs and, and actuals by Bank Negara, I'm surprised that our potential GDP today is only at around 4.5%. I think we, ne we need to rebuild this potential. And we can do it only by reforms.
and these reforms in, uh, involve innovation, talent, up the scale of manufacturing and services. But so most important, in order to get discipline in, we need a strong rigor. We need a policy on the exchange rate. This is ignored by everybody. If you ask the government what is your policy on exchange rate, I'm not sure they can tell you. But their action says it's weakening it. And as I argued just now, a weak ringgit doesn't benefit Malaysia. Labor needs serious overhaul. Income distribution, we need to rebalance. Wages and profits. Profits is taking too much of the cake, not wages. That's what the latest figures show. Taxes, the incidence of the middle class. I always tell my university professors that I wish they would do research on the impact of fiscal taxes on the middle class. You know, if you are middle class today, you are the brunt of every tax in town, from direct to indirect, especially indirect taxes. So we should we start looking at disposable income rather than income per se. Debt, getting too much, is already 1.7, almost 1.7 times uh, the income, and too high, depending on the private or, or corporates or households. Corporates go up to 110, households are 90, too high. Education. I was with the Minister of Finance the whole of morning last yesterday, talking about education and what needs to be done. He's a good man. He's trying to do, to upgrade. But I think he's caught in the system. The whole system has to be overhauled. And unfortunately here, Again, you know, I have a beef with the World Bank all the time. He keeps on quoting the World Bank, saying that the World Bank says we are doing okay. I hope he's wrong. But he quoted more than once. That the World Bank says we are okay. So why is Harvard saying we are not okay? That's what he told me. Yeah. And this is a big disappointment, I must say. Okay, I think that's all I want to talk about, reforms and things like that, before I get into trouble. <laughs> as I mentioned just now, I have been, uh, as Johan said just now, I've been involved in, together with Raymond, with every plan that this country has put out from the 60s. Given our inexperience in those days, we already talk about GNP. That's not good enough for the future. GNP measures economic activity, production, unemployment, and things like that, the quality of change. We need to shift to well-being. And to start off with, we need to talk about material living standards. Material living standards are associated with income and consumption mainly from the perspective of households. That's important. We tend to miss this out. But that's not good enough. We need to look at income and consumption jointly with wealth. I'm not sure how good our wealth statistics are, but we need to compile them. We need to look at them together in order to get the full picture. And with it, of course, 
distribution, not just of income, but wealth. On top of that, we also need to look at non-market non -market activities and the role of leisure and productivity. The trouble is, well-being is complicated, not easy to measure. Well-being is multidimensional, and it has both objective and subjective aspects. So besides material <coughs> living, material living standards, we have to look at health, education together, personal activities, politics, demographics, social intercourse, environment, insecurity. All we have, need to bring ourselves down to talking about the quality of life. So we need to devise new measures to be able to capture all this before we can, we can put up a talk of transformation. And finally, well-being has to be sustainable. And so these sustainable aspects, many parts of which are new, much of it have to do with just facts. Unfortunately, he's not here to tell you more about it. But suffice to say that we, I was with him, uh, <clears throat> with Jeffrey Chia in uh, New York recently, and we were discussing about the new UN pact on meeting sustainable development goals. I think this is important. So all these have to be put together into a dashboard of indicators. And we, well, in order to do that, we need to look at the stock of natural resources, human, social, physical capital. So it's a huge exercise. You have 35 years to do it, but I hope you'll do it in five. Yeah. But this is important because this should be the way we should be looking at our future. No longer just as GNP. So sustainability is something which I'm sure uh, Wayne will be organizing new activities around it. And I hope that uh, I have succeeded this afternoon or this morning to bring you all a perspective from where I stand with my feet firmly on the ground. Thank you very much. After the two excellent presentations, I've decided I should not present what I had planned. I will not use my PowerPoints, but instead uh, make it less uh, possibly fluent a presentation that you have to sit through a stream of consciousness about my life. <clears throat> Because Johan talked about transformation, and then Tan Siri said reforms is what is needed for a transformation, what I would like to do is to talk about the transformations I was involved in from 1989 to 1997, when there was this, when I worked in Eastern Europe and in China and Vietnam to change all of them from central plainly planned economies to market economies. That was truly a transformation. Johan's presentation had two parts. The first part is a review of the past, and the second part 
a vision of the future. It would be, one could quibble about the review of the past, and I would only raise one small point, which is how successful have we been. The definition of high income as a particular level of income is just wrong. Malaysia today is richer than the richest country in the world in 1914. But what was rich then is now just middle income now. So what is relevant is, are we able to be at the level of living standard that is the highest available to anybody? Basically, what is the amount we need to catch up to be with the richest seven countries in the world? So you should take our living standard divided by the living standard of one of the countries that we recognize as being at the cutting edge. On that uh, level, we find that Latin America has been stuck at 30% of US level from 1930 to today. It's not that Latin American income did not go up, it just stayed at 30% of US level. It never grew faster than the US. Malaysia went from 10%, 13% in 1960. We reached 30% in 1994. And depending on whether you use World Bank data or you use the data of Angus Madison, Angus Madison said we were, 94, we were 30% in 1994, we are 30% today. The World Bank says we are now 35% today. So we had progress, but small progress. Korea and Taiwan were poorer than us in 1960. Today, both of them are twice our level of income. So what's the secret of happiness? One is to take one is to possibly take pride in your achievement. The other one is to set your expectations low. We are certainly much better than Mugabe's Zimbabwe. So on that level, yes, we have not done badly, but we might have done better. But that's the past. The future is wide ahead of us, and what kind of reforms should we try to do? So what was exciting when I hear Johan's uh, presentation was, he mentioned no mechanisms to translate the vision into reality. This should be the start of a prolonged collaboration, hopefully, between uh, JCI and our uh, uh, research partners globally and, uh, and, uh, and, and the government. Let's think about growth. He calls it the moonshot. How do you get to the moon? You're not going to get there in a sailboat, for sure. Even if you install a stronger engine, an outboard motor, you're not going to get to the moon. You can put a bigger engine onto the car, you're not going to get to the moon. You need the right vehicle. And for the vehicle to work, basically, the hardware got to be OK. But then the software has to be OK. The pilots cannot be fighting inside the cockpit and produce an MH370 outcome again, right? So that's why the unity, which he talked about at the very end, we get the picture from the movie, that there has to be common national purpose. So the software is important. Next one is the power supply. Hut drives the engine. We hear about consumption-led growth. That's what the World Bank tells China. And China says, growth is, there are two things. One is use, full usage of existing capacity. We have this production possibility. We want to reach the top. Consumption can pull you up to 
maximum usage capacity. But growth is increase in your production capacity. You cannot have increased the production capacity if you don't either have more investment or new technology. But new technology comes through a new investment. Ultimately, has to be investment-driven growth. There's no such thing as consumption-driven growth unless you are below capacity and you're moving up to capacity. OK. Now let's talk about, I'll give brief examples of what I see the key reforms are in hardware, software, power supply. The first thing of, a, of hardware that was replaced in the Eastern European countries and which we stopped growth in Indonesia in 1966 after the Sukarno's uh, policy was the re-empowerment of the private sector subject to good regulation from the government. In Malaysia, the most amazing thing is the growth of the state government-linked companies. Government companies, if they are to exist, they are to effect a transfer of technology to the country that the private sector is afraid to invest in. What is the government doing buying up private construction real estate development companies? What is real estate design that the, private, the government can do, the private sector cannot do, at least as well? I think that a lot of it had to do with um, reforms you have to make in the political patronage system. That's what that's killing. There has been a recent book assessing the state enterprises. And the book came with a remarkably optimistic conclusion. He said all the GLCs are in general not losing money, and they're all managed by professionals. All the, East, all the Russian companies were managed by professionals when they all went bankrupt. Basically, what is important is what's their productivity growth. Not the fact that, not that they are not just losing money. The important thing is, are they generating a transfer in technology? From, but let me stop right there for hardware. Basically, the engine of growth has to be the private sector with the government working with it to bring about, to ensure efficiency. It is not just usage to full capacity, but efficiency. Software. Software, you, you know, like uh, you, is the governance system. Basically, if you, we, we in Malaysia are lucky that we are able to change the governance system if we want, because we have free elections because it's only with uh, free and just elections that we can have a good monitoring system and a good accountability mechanism. And for a good monitoring system, you need a free press. And uh, the decision to allow very limited censorship of uh, the online media may be a painful decision to the government right now, but I think it was the correct one. Because you cannot bring about change without people being correctly informed of the situation. Feedback, free press. But they're having a free press only part of it. The other one has to be the legal system has to be independent and uphold the law. Free press, independent judiciary. The third is what that really makes it work, a free and fair elect voting system. Things like gerrymandering is one thing, but how about my apportionment? Every seat should have about the same people. Then we would have social inclusiveness and an improved monitoring system. So software. And how about what we call the power supply? What drives the system? I said consumption-led growth is something that is mistaken 
a mistake between maximum capacity usage versus increase in production capacity. That's what I say. But what's the real engine of growth? He said, Simon Kuznets told him, it's either demography or productivity. Either reproductivity or productivity. <laughs> Clearly, the reproductivity is a dead end, largely because uh, what you want is you cannot be richer unless you are able to produce more. Just having more total GNP is not the key. For productivity, there are two things that are needed. One is brain power to have innovations to drive the system. And the second is the financial power to finance the innovations. In Malaysia, the alarming development on the brain power part is the, the brain drain is getting to be increasingly multiracial in nature. That's bad for this. I think that's un, unusual. When people talk about uh, is the high income abroad that's pulling them out, yes, it has always existed. But there surely need not be something inside here pushing them out either. Because the main reason that people move, I think, has less to do with the high income. Most people say, my life is like that of a dog. It doesn't matter if I'm mistreated or not uh, have a future. But my children must have a future. The brain drain phenomena is less what they see as the difference in income than the future they see for their children. Then the financial power. Well, Malaysia is number three in the total amount of capital flight in the world after United States, Mexico. No, not United States, China, China, sorry. The China number, I forgot, is very big. But if you look at a per capita basis, China is like 300 US dollars per year per person running out. Mexico is around 550 per year per person running out. Malaysia is $2,750 per year per, running, per person running out. This is not a sustainable situation. That's why the uni national unity in uh, com pursuits of common goals is exceedingly important. Hardware, I gave an example, software, governance, power supply has to do with the retention of brain power and financial power. The other thing that should at least mention very briefly is that it's the big environment in which we live in. If there is no global cooperation on bringing uh, decarbonization of energy system, we are all go going to end up very much worse off on not being here. So the global environment is important important, which is what the JSC seeks to do. We all think globally and will act locally to be responsible stakeholders in the world. But what is also important is not just the global environment, but the global political environment. The competition now between China and the US will, can only heat up. And what we now have is a multipolar world. The United States is no longer the overwhelming hegemony. And what is the historical outcome when you've got a multipolar world? The historical outcome of a multipolar world is the division of the world into spheres of influence. What we see in Ukraine today and in the South China Sea are the first manifestations of this reappearance of the spheres of influence. Traditionally, these spheres of influence were spheres of economic exploitation, colonies. Then, after World War II, spheres of political domination, Eastern Europe, by the Russians. I think it will be a lack of imagination to think that we need to repeat the mistakes of the past. We should turn these spheres of influence into geographical clusters of economic development, 
but that could be true only if Malaysia is able to galvanize its ASEAN neighbors to be able to affect the US-Chinese competition such that the sphere of influence that exists is actually a geographical cluster for economic development. Let us open the floor for discussion. Tan Sri Nawa, why don't you begin? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wu. You know, I must say this is one of the rare, refreshing mornings. And I want to congratulate on all our behalf the three brilliant speakers. Dr. Lin and I go back a long time. In fact, I must say I'm older than him. <laughs> so I got less time to wait. Johan's uh, uncle was my boss, Malik Marikan. So Malik, CNN, and myself, we had a lot of fun in drafting the new economic policy. At that time, it was very pertinent and relevant given the trauma of the times. But I'm afraid now listening to uh, Johan on the TN50, the way forward, I think the NEP and politics are the elephant in the room. The last slide Johan mentioned the word continuity. Frankly, I think TN50 will be a failure if we adapt continuity of the old policies uh, with strong elements of the NEP. Because then we become race-based and planned economy rather than the normal economic thinking and planning that Lindsay and talked about in terms of wealth and flows. So I'm asking the panel now, would you recommend to government that TN50 will only work not because of com continuity, but major reforms that Professor Wu and Dr. Lin have been talking about? Otherwise, I'm afraid we'll be on the wrong track, like Robert Cox said. Thank you. Can the two panel members be very specific and specify and give us two recommendations. So Tan Sri, can you say specifically two reforms? Reform number one, reform number two. And Johan, to get to TN50, can you say what are the two things that need to be done, very specifically? Without going into we must all hold hands and smile and clap. And <laughs> oh, my name is Tan Sri Rainer. Um, my background is I'm also a, a, a member of the Jeffrey Chia Foundation. And uh, what I would like to address is uh, after we enjoyed this refreshing wave of information and key indicators for future economies and reforms, I would like to address uh, one um, issue which is important for well-being of people and has a direct impact to it. It's about connectivity. So connectivity on three levels, I want to uh, draw attention on two. Uh, number one is connectivity in terms of uh, connectivity in the communication world and connectivity to internet. The whole world is going digital now, as we all know, and without an limited, with a limited access to the internet, per se, by technology, or by limit, other limitations would not allow a, an economy to grow. The second level of connectivity is connectivity among people on the move. I think uh, the urbanization of the economies, primarily the growing ones in the world, is based upon connectivity among people inside the urban areas. It means, in principle, it's the connectivity via public transport. And Malaysia is on a good way now because uh, the government decided to in invest into uh, railroad transport after uh, many, many years of uh, road transport lines, like mean highways, autobahns, and so on. So in the year 2026, we do expect a rail, uh, urban rail public uh, network in Kuala Lumpur, in Greater Kuala Lumpur, of maybe 150 kilometers of MRT lines and 
in addition, three uh, extended LRT lines. That means connectivity of people on the move allows a better quality of living. Uh, number three would be uh, connectivity in terms of moving goods. So we are moving into the digitization, and as we have heard uh, uh, from uh, Jack Ma as well, that uh, the delivery after an online uh, <clears throat> selling uh, issue until five o'clock in the afternoon, you can expect the delivery of goods at the next morning, 10 o'clock at the doorstep of your house. So that means that type of connectivity is a driver and key indicator for future economies we need to take up. Let me first address uh, Tanshri, Tanshri Ramon. Um, um, I think, don't get me wrong, I think actually even in my presentation, I think there's a lot of alignment um, even with what Tanshri Lin Sien presented. And I think certainly um, when we talk about TN50, um, it's not just the fact that we just so happen to reach, um, we're close to 2020 and it's time for a new vision. I think there's certainly a recognition uh, by the government that there are many um, major structural change at the world and many issues that remain to be challenges uh, in the country that require reform or, or transformation uh, as whatever uh, language that, that myself or Tantri Lin uses. Um, but Having said that, whilst there does need to be a fundamental uh, change or, or reform, um, I at least would still maintain that there are certain formulas to past policies that should be retained. And, I mean, I, I certainly agree that we need to move towards a more needs-based uh, and not race-based. I think that's certainly I mean, articulated in the new economic model. I think that's, that's somewhere where I, I would agree with Tanshu. But certainly some of our past approaches in terms of a commitment to a market-based economy, a commitment towards being an uh, open global trading uh, economy, I think is something that we should continue, especially in the current environment where we see many countries now seeming to reverting back to more nationalist uh, sentiment. So, so I think, so, you know, so I, I fully agree the need for, for, for change, but certainly uh, let's not throw the, the baby out of the bathwater. So that, that's probably my, my quick um, response to Tanshi Ramon. Um, maybe then to address uh, what Anna Jumaboy uh, mentioned, yeah, so apologies, yeah, we economists speak in a, a different language. Um, maybe, and again, um, the, the, maybe just to give two, two areas of, of reform. I think there's certainly a recognition that the current economic model or the economic model that has helped us achieve success thus far certainly is not a model that would enable us to um, maintain or achieve a new, new success. And, and we've been very um, successful in a past model which relied on low cost, uh, whether labor or otherwise, uh, energy intensive, and also um, very FDI-driven um, um, growth, growth drivers. I think going forward, um, and, and I think this is also um, touched on by Tanish, we can't rely on, say, for example, uh, a, a cheap ringgit-led led, led growth. Um, you know, that we're, we've already passed uh, that stage of development where we can run. Um, certainly, particularly thinking again about the challenges of being a more sustainable future, certainly we cannot sustain a very um, resource uh, intensive, whether that's fuel or, or natural resource intensive um, uh, model to, to drive us forward. And, and last but not least, I think, w you know, we can't be always be relying and being uh, what, what we call an imitator or importer of, of, of technology. There's no way that Malaysia can really reach the next level from, from where we are. We're really going to be a high income and standing amongst the, the ranks of giants. We can't certainly be one that continues to rely on just imported technology. We do need to you know, really build our own innovation uh, a pipeline. So there is a certain need to reform the, you know, I think the main uh, economic model that drives our economic activities. That's one. Um, second, um, perhaps my intention showing the film is not that we all smile and, and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Um, I, I think what I perhaps was trying to also motivate is there does need to be greater alignment or, or as what uh, Professor Wu mentioned, a common sense of, of purpose. I think there's a real risk that um, we are a relatively small country with our finite resources. We do tend in our different sectors be potentially focusing on different things. And what I mean is that, you know, whether, you know, the, the government side, um, what private sector is doing, what academia is doing. I think we have no choice really, but given our, our 
size of, of economy and size of resources and the global competitiveness challenges that we face, we really do need to decide what are we going to pick uh, or what are we going to all galvanize together and say, this is where we will win. Um, at a global level, um, you know, taking the sport parlance, you know, we may all love football, but I don't think we're probably going to win the World Cup uh, anytime soon. Uh, whereas, obviously, we've, we've, you know, we've shown that we're pretty com competitive in terms of, say, badminton and, and squash or diving. These are some areas where we have competitive advantage, where we can then succeed. What is that economic equivalent where we can really work together, very collaborate across? Uh, government, private sector, academia, research, uh, and our research community, so that we're all focusing on the same areas rather than doing our own thing, uh, end up being uh, masters, masters of none. So I think that national alignment is 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 required. So I I, I hope that's still not economic gobby speak for for, for you. Um, let me respond to that, Rina. Really um, agreed. Um, connectivity is important, and I think this comes back. Um, I, I know uh, Tan Sri Lin is not a big fan of the World Bank's <laughs> methodologies, but, but certainly we are, are quite influenced by some of the work they've done on economic geography, uh, which does suggest this 3D framework um, of uh, density, um, distance, and division. This idea that we want you know, highly competitive urban centers as being, uh, I guess, a key concentration of, of growth, because that's where you get really the concentration of knowledge workers and innovation to drive the the whole national uh, competitiveness. And, and if we're going to then have these um, uh, key urban centers, whether it's uh, the Kang Valley, uh, Penang, JB, and, 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 and likes, we need to ensure that these urban centers are uh, continue to be um, highly livable cities, uh, highly efficient cities, and clearly connectivity is key, not just for within the city, but connectivity then with the, the, hit, the rural hinterland to ensure the flow of goods and, and, and the rest. So I think that certainly is something that is in the thinking of government as we, as we look forward to future um, national development. The first reform is that, how shall I put it? Government should do what it says it will do. You know, you know what I mean? The government says we'll do everything. We'll do anything what we do, but they don't do it. You have to do what you say you would do. And that's important. Second, education. I think everything is built on education. We need real reforms in education, right from kindergartens to university. There are lots of things to be done. But that's critical because we need the talent, we need the, the, the skills, we need the te technicalities of labor. That's, that's, to me, is number one. The second thing is to move away from cheap labor production. Use the talent that you grow at the universities, retain them, bring them back from abroad, and build our industries, including manufacturing. And the third thing is, we have done said this many times, we have done it and turned back reforms of SOEs. The role of government is to facilitate not to compete with the private sector, to help and complement the private, what the private sector does. If we can do this, we have gone very far, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to, I cannot resist but to point out that the question of what are the two things you need to do to fix it. Suppose each of them had mentioned two each. I would say all four of them would still not be able to fix it because it really depends on the problem. If a patient comes in whose heart has stopped beating, the one thing you should do is to give the guy an electric shock to get the heart pumping again. But that's not, so, but that's not what else should be done. That's the one thing you have to do first. The other thing is there has to be a change in the lifestyle of that individual. Stop eating fat food, stop smoking, start exercising, you know, rather than just continue the way you are, and if you get another heart attack again, it will give you another shock. <laughs> you know, that, that is not going to work. So 
The important thing is there's no silver bullet. And furthermore, the success of one depends on success in a whole bunch of stuff. Hardware, software, power supply. If your computer doesn't work, it might be a hard disk problem. It could be that your op operating system is not working, or you forgot to plug in the power cord. So all three needs to be working. And for pro progress, basically, economic, social, political uh, uh, success is a virtuous cycle. So I agree that there are what you can say about one, two, three, but the important thing is we have to need a clear view of the vision, which is supply. Now what we need is a clear, clear view of the mechanisms to bring us there. On the top, on, we are, I agree with you that we need urban centers, multiple urban centers. U.S. is strong because the multiple urban centers translated into multiple centers of technological innovation. Stanford stands in the same rank in competing uh, in technological innovations as Harvard, MIT. And then you have got a cluster in the Chicago area. Basically, progress occurs because of imitation and competition. So that's why you need multiple centers of, uh, of excellence and you connect them. But in order for these multiple centers to happen, there has to be decentralization of the governance system. Basically, how did we get on the strategy of inviting FDI to come into Malaysia to, to industrialize the country? It started out of desperation in Penang because Lim Chong Il in 1970 knew that he was not going to get a single penny from Tan Siu Sin to, in, to, to industrialize Penang. So he thought out of the box, and which was to invite the foreigners in to Malaysia. And that was against the thinking of that time. But the important thing was, when, when it worked in Penang, all the other military bazaars became excellent hosts of foreign companies, and it became a national policy. The success of China comes because of the existence of multiple centers of policy initiatives. What they do in Shenzhen works, the other places copy and do it. And in Malaysia, because of the absence of fiscal decentralization, where the local governments have no money to be able to build the infrastructure to support local industry, has stunted growth in Malaysia. That's why all the infrastructure built in the Klang Valley, that's why everything is focused here in the Klang Valley. Like, where did the internet revolution in Malaysia, where did that was best supported? In Penang. But Cyber Jaya is not built anywhere near Penang. What I'm saying is that there has to be, just like we talked about state and private sector, the division of labor, and within the private sector, there has to be competition. We need to have competition among the various state governments to grow their individual states, and that will require a transformation of the national system of public finance. That the raising of money does not automatically go to Putrajaya, and then Putrajaya distribute it at its uh, whims, but we need a regular system of public finance as in the United States. We still have got lots of discussion to go, but unfortunately, well, fortunately, we have got lots to talk about the next time. <laughs> so thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you our next event. And a big hand to our two <laughs> panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>